Welcome back to Build Something, the channel where I show you my project car build process in order to encourage and enable your own projects. Let me start off today by saying that I'm not that good with electrical systems. I like to think I understand mechanical systems pretty darn well, but electrical systems, those are really difficult for me. I swapped a giant 12 valve Cummins into this tiny little Explorer. This was a really difficult project because it was a 1200 pound engine that replaced a tiny little 400 pound engine. And it was a pretty ridiculous swap. However, most of the mechanical aspects of it, just getting things to fit where they needed to be and getting the engine into the car, that wasn't what was difficult for me. Don't get me wrong, it took thousands of hours and a whole lot of sweat, blood, and tears in order to get this thing in here, but I know how to weld, I know how to make brackets, I could get this thing to fit in this car if I put in enough work. The thing that's hard for me is the electrical side of it. No matter how much time I put into the electrical, it doesn't do me any good if I don't understand how electrical works. So the first thing to do when confronted with an issue like this is to get to learning. And that's exactly what I did. As problems came up, I tried to teach myself how to fix them. For example, just because the engine's in the car doesn't mean the swap's done. I still need a way for the engine to communicate with the monkey behind the steering wheel. Being able to drive it's all well and good, but if you have no idea what your engine RPM is or your oil pressure or your engine temperature or anything like that, you're kind of playing with fire. You need to know what's going on with your engine. To solve this problem, I tried to design my own electronic data logging system to take all the info coming from the engine and display it to me, the driver. The system I came up with is based on Arduino. This is a open source PLC or a programmable logic controller. And it's really good for hobbyists or newcomers to convert mechanical crap into electronic crap. I was able to design a little computer system that was able to read things like the crank trigger on the engine to know how fast the engine is rotating. The Arduino also read the fuel pressure, which was really useful for me because I was having some issues with this thing running that that's helping me to troubleshoot. Once I had this little Arduino computer set up, then I was able to get the mechanical data from the engine, but the only way I was able to read it was by plugging in a laptop, and I wasn't going to drive around with a laptop plugged in all the time. So the next thing I needed was a way to actually display the information now that I've grabbed it. I ended up going with what's called an HMI or human machine interface. It's exactly what it sounds like. It displays information from a machine or a computer uh, to a human. Basically a cheap little Chinese touch screen that can take serial output from the Arduino. This is kind of a tiny little screen though. So I decided that for things like the RPM signal, I was actually going to try to drive the stock tachometer with that. I really like the look of an analog gauge and it meant that I had a lot more room on the touch screen for other things I needed to watch. This was really tricky for me. In order to drive the stock tachometer and even just to get the signal out of the engine, I had to take really small voltages and amplify them into big voltages and I had to do it hundreds of times a second or so. To make this work, I had to teach myself how to use electronic switches that can cycle it hundreds of times a second. These electronic switches are called transistors and they're kind of black magic, especially for somebody who's more familiar with the mechanical side. It took me weeks of research in order to figure out how these little things worked and make them work for what I was trying to do. So great, I've got this Arduino system in the car, it's feeding an HMI, it can tell me my fuel pressure, it can tell me my, the speed of the engine on the tachometer. That's all well and good, but there are actually other functions on this engine that need to be driven. The engine itself is purely mechanical, which made the swap a lot easier, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing that the computer needs to drive. One example is that it has gotten really cold in Idaho lately. This thing was already running rough, but with how cold it's gotten, it barely was running at all. So the next thing is I needed to get my grid heaters to work. Grid heaters in a Cummins are kind of like glow plugs in any other diesel. Because diesels work with compression ignition, it has to get the air charge really warm in order for it to actually fire. So on some engines, they'll put a little heater straight in the combustion chamber and that's called a glow plug and they'll run that heater when it's cold outside in order to make sure that you're still getting good combustion. On a Cummins, they don't put it directly in the cylinder, they put it in the intake. There's actually two of them. So you have these two giant heaters in your intake called grid heaters. If you turn your key on and you see a wait to start light, this is what you're waiting for, is you're waiting for either your glow plugs or a grid heater to warm up enough that the engine's actually gonna start. The only computer in this thing though is the one that I built. So I needed to find a way to get my Arduino system to run the grid heaters. 
And the grid heaters run on 12 volt and they pull a lot of amperage. So it's not like I can just plug them straight into the Arduino. The way the grid heaters work is they have this giant set of relays that's wired straight to the battery and the computer sends a 12 volt signal to the relay, closes the relay, and then you have this big thick battery cable that runs amperage straight to the grid heaters and it pulls a lot of amperage. I tested it with my system and if I just used a five volt output on the Arduino, it wasn't quite enough to get that relay to click over. Now I don't know if you can see where this is going, but since the Arduino has a five volt output, but I needed 12 volts to flip the relay on, this meant I needed to use transistors again. I had to switch it back to that 12 volts. Pretty nervous about this because the last time I used transistors, it took me three weeks to figure them out, but I figured I'd give it a go. So I wired it up. I rewatched my lecture on transistors from last time. I looked through my wiring diagrams, soldered it all onto the board. And the first time I tried it, it worked. I couldn't believe it. Apparently that three weeks of trying to learn electronics actually paid off and I was able to get this to work on my first try. That was an awesome moment for me. It made me feel like I hadn't wasted all that time beating my head against trying to learn electronics. I was actually able to get it to work. That's a new skill in my tool belt that I am very glad to have. So I'm able to get the Arduino to send a 12 volt signal to the relay now. I hooked it all up on the bench and it works great. The next step was I needed the Arduino to know when it needed to turn on the grid heaters. The way the stock computer does this is it reads the intake air temperature sensor or IEAT and when it's cold enough in the intake, it flips them on. I figured I'd do the exact same thing. There's also an additional problem I wanted to try to solve here. A lot of people actually remove the grid heaters from their truck and one of the reasons they do that is because they draw a lot of amperage. So they're kind of known as alternator killers. I figured maybe I'd be able to help this situation out a little bit if, if I turned only one of the two grid heaters on at a time. So anytime the IAT reads under 60 degrees, one grid heater goes on. And then anytime it reads under 40 degrees, both heaters go on. That means the majority of the time it's running, it's only ever going to use one grid heater, which should be way nicer on the engine. But it also means that when it's below freezing outside, that it'll actually use both and try to help me get it started. Hopefully that'll save my alternator. So I needed to read the stock IAT sensor. The stock sensor is a thermistor. It's a little resistor that changes its resistance based on the temperature outside. And all you need to do is read the resistance in order to know how cold it is. That's a little bit of a problem though because an Arduino can't just read resistance. There's no ohm meter in an Arduino. So the way that you indirectly read the resistance is you read voltage drop because according to Ohm's law, voltage drop and resistance are related. So my first thought was, okay, great. I just hook it up in series and I see how much voltage drops to the resistor. That doesn't really work because if there's only one source of resistance in the circuit, all of your voltage gets dropped through that one source of resistance and it doesn't really tell you anything. In order to actually read it, you need two resistors. One resistor is a known value and the other resistor is the variable resistor. And then that way you can see how much voltage is dropped through the variable resistor compared to how much voltage is dropped in the known resistor in order to know what was the resistance to the variable resistor. This is known as a voltage divider and here's the circuit for it. Notice that the Arduino is actually reading the voltage between the two resistors and then you have to make a little function that tunes your particular voltage divider circuit to your particular thermistor. The easiest way to tune this is to just take a known temperature value and see what kind of voltage it spits out. One thing to note here is given how much resistance your thermistor has at the temperatures you actually wanna read, that's what you use to determine what the size of normal resistor is in the circuit. You wanna make sure that you're getting good resolution for the values that actually matter. You can measure your thermistor's resistance at near a temperature that you're interested in and put in a static resistor that's somewhere in the range of that resistance. Then once your circuit's set up, you actually need to calibrate it. For example, in my case, I had a little temperature sensor and I measured the room temperature at 70 degrees or whatever it was, and I wrote down what the voltage value was at room temperature. Then I took the thermistor and wrapped it in a Ziploc bag so it would be waterproof and then dunked it in a bucket of ice water. And I measured the temperature of the ice water and that gave me a voltage reading around freezing. With those two values, basically freezing and room temperature, I was able to program it so that I could get my turn one on at 60 degrees, turn the other one at 40 degrees or whatever other combination I needed. So I wired it all up and I tested it on the bench. And when I plunged the thermistor into the ice water, after 10 or 20 seconds, I can hear one relay click on 
And then another 10 or 20 seconds later, I hear another relay click on. Perfect, that's exactly what I wanted. On the bench, this thing's working. I needed to get the relays actually physically attached to the car. I did this using rib nuts. If you've never used these, they're incredibly useful. There'll be links in the description to all this stuff I'm using in this video in case you wanna do something similar. Rib nuts are one of those things that are just super useful to have. So next I need to wire it all up and by the second time I did it, I actually got it right. The way I displayed this information to the driver was I made this cute little sizzling bacon icon with a number one or a number two and I put that on my HMI so that I could see is only one grid heater on or are both grid heaters on. A nice visual indicator so that I know what's going on. So now that's all wired, I turned the key on and both grid heaters came on. That's awesome. I mean, it's not awesome that my garage is so cold that both the grid heaters came on. That part kind of sucks, but the fact that it worked was great. I left it on for 10 or 20 seconds and then I went and put my hand on the intake and it was hot to the touch. I understand why people say these are alternator killers because that takes a lot of energy to make the intake on this Cummins hot to the touch. Next was to see if it made the car run any better. The thing started right up. Now don't get me wrong, this thing still has a fueling issue, but it ran really well. I had this thing out here idling for like 20 minutes and when I was done, I came inside and my whole house didn't even smell like diesel. Usually if I even run this thing for 20 seconds, when I go inside, the whole house smells like diesel and my partner's not very happy with me. But this time, they didn't even realize I was running the thing hardly. The house didn't smell like diesel, the garage wasn't full of smoke, the grid heaters really made a big difference. So I'm glad I put all that work in to make them work. So I took this thing from barely wanting to start in cold weather to starting right up with a single bump of the key. And then instead of just billowing smoke the whole time while it warms up, it's burning pretty clean. That's a big improvement. When you're working on project cars, it can be really easy to come up with an excuse like, I'm bad with electrical or I'm bad with body work or whatever it may be and use that as an excuse to give up on learning how to do it. If that's your excuse though, you'll always be bad at that thing. The only way to learn how to do things is to actually make an attempt at doing them. Do the research, try to make it work. Don't just pay for somebody else to do it, figure out how to do it yourself. Don't watch these videos and think to yourself, I could never do that. Anybody who actually learns to build project cars got there by struggling their way through it and teaching themselves these skills. You aren't burnt born knowing how to do these things, you gotta learn them. So get out there and learn them. One of the best investments you can make is investing in yourself. And if you don't have the money to do it, well, maybe you have the time to pick up a new skill. Either way, an additional skill in the toolbox is an incredibly valuable thing to have and it'll make you a better overall project car builder. As frustrating as it was for me to try to learn the black magic pixie wrangling of electronics, I'm really glad that I keep beating my head against it and teaching myself more things about it. It's really starting to pay off for me. And I hope that that comes across in my videos. My videos, I spend all my time talking about my own project car but I'm also really interested in what you're working on. This episode's featured build comes from a viewer named Chris. This is a bullnose Bronco with a 5.8 liter engine. It has a lift kit and it looks like it may have a bit of a cage in it as well. Very cool rig, Chris. Thanks for sending it in. And if you'd like your own project car featured on the channel, then send me some pictures or even a video to builds at buildautomedia.com. I'd love to see what you're working on. Now that this thing will run in the cold weather, hopefully I'll have a lot easier time trying to troubleshoot the fueling issues that I was having before. If you want to see me try and fix those issues, subscribe and stick around. And if you liked this video, then you'd probably like my other Arduino project videos. Go ahead and click on this playlist if you want to see those. Thank you for hanging out with me in my garage today. Now, get out there and build something. I hope to see you next time.